I'm kind of like rationalizing this now, almost when you're dating, when you're in your thirties or when you're older, it's way easier to have those conversations like fertility and marriage. Like they seem to come up a lot quicker, which I remember in my twenties, you have to like avoid acting like you like the guy you have to avoid, like you want anything serious. And it's interesting how, like, once you turn a certain age, everyone's like, well, yeah, are we going to be able to last? (laughs) It's like almost very unromantic in a way, but also romantic in, you know? Yeah. I think that's really fascinating that how we kind of make a shift because our priorities shift that we're like, yeah, we have to figure out if this is going to work, which becomes, I guess, in a way less romantic, but I can still appreciate it. You may have been cheated a little bit of this experience, but, uh, because of who your bachelor was, but I actually, (laughs) yeah, I want to talk about that because I'm (laughs) kind of pissed. (laughs) I actually really enjoyed that aspect of the bachelor. And that made me more comfortable going forth and dating, um, Mm. really sitting down with Ari on like a first date and being able to talk about the future or actual intentions was pretty powerful. And it showed me how stupid it was to go out on dates with guys and just pretend to be this cool girl who doesn't even have an eye to the future. And is just taking things, you know, day by day. Mm -hmm. So it was very New York dating style. Mm -hmm. That was me all the time in New York city, because it felt like with the, the guys I was dating there, they were horrified of anything serious or like any questions that involves anything besides the moment right now, or the (laughs) potential of having sex later that night. Like that's all they cared about. So, I mean, I went on really bad dates, so it's not everyone, but most people. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I definitely feel like my bachelor experience was a little bit robbed. I, yeah, I wanted, I went into that situation because I want to, I want to ask you how, what your mindset was going on the show, but I went into that situation, taking myself out of my normal life of like doing the regular dating scene in New York city and being frustrated and putting so much focus on my career and no, no focus at all on dating. Mm -hmm. Um, it was kind of just like a flippant thing that I did on the side, but then I was like, okay, I'm committing to this process. I'm taking this big leap of faith and I'm going on this crazy show and I'm going to date this guy. And, (laughs) and all we talked about was like, we didn't talk about the weather, but basically that's what most of our conversations were about was like the weather, what we did that day. It's just like very (laughs) not romantic and not, there was no like hot and heavy. And I, I chopped that up to like me at the time, but it's nice having like this, you know, hindsight is 2020 and realizing that wasn't the case. So I'm wondering for you, like what, why did you want to go on the show? Cause I think you and I are maybe not the typical people they have on the show. Like, as far as I tend to be quiet and I know you're like very, like you're very on the education track and it's so, I feel like there's maybe one every season that is like that, but you are rare for the franchise. And I really appreciated you on the show. So like, what was your mindset at least going on the bachelor for you? So first of all, I did, I also wanted to say that I really appreciated your breakup with him because you were so matter of fact, almost like there was no, (laughs) there was no emotion. emotion. You're just like, (laughs) like, I, (laughs) is there anything here? Yeah. Like, do you feel anything for me? No. Great. Great. (laughs) Thought so. (laughs) Perfect. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, I mean, it is kind of ironic because you went on for really romantic reasons and then mm-hmm. broke up with him and in, in a very kind of emotionless, pragmatic way. And then I went in for totally not romantic reasons mm-hmm. and then left very emotional. <laughs> like, um, I went on for the adventure. Mm-hmm. I mean, I didn't sign up for it myself. Like my friend nominated me and I guess he was sort of serious about it, but I just took it as a joke and then completely forgot it happened. I think, I mean, I might even have been like dating somebody at the time. It, mm-hmm. it was just so like, he would just send me texts like, what's your height and weight? I'd be like, yeah, whatever. Here you go. I, I wasn't paying attention to it. Yeah. Like, so when they called, I was just floored. And then I continued to be floored by how easy the audition process was. Mm-hmm. I think I, so I've always like had a high proportion of my friends who are much older and I can resonate more, I think with like, <laughs> middle-aged people and so Mm -hmm. since the audition process was all of these like middle-aged people (laughs) you're like I got more success (laughs) exactly it's like I got they made me comfortable like Mm -hmm. there's I was very very intimidated about going on and meeting the other women Mm -hmm. and and the bachelor um although I really like that Ari was chosen because he's so like kind of like sheepish and he's Mm -hmm. actually really confident but there's there's this like boyish energy that he puts out um yeah I they called and it was horrible timing. I had just started this new job that I really, really needed. And then obviously like this led to my breakup, mm-hmm. but it, it was, I'm such an, like, 
I said this on the show, like experience junkie, like part of what I loved about New York was, oh my gosh, today I'm at this random bar and everybody is snorting cacao. So I'm going to snort cacao because that's something I haven't tried before, even yeah. though it's stupid and like has no, real nothing happens. <laughs> yeah. you just have a black nose. <laughs> exactly. That burns like a lot. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just that kind of like, I always have to try things mm -hmm. and this terrified me. And so I know if something terrifies me that I probably have to do it. Oh, um, that could work for your advantage and very much disadvantage in other situations, but yeah, I mean, if something is just so clearly dangerous and a stupid yeah. idea and doesn't provide any benefit, then I'm not pressured into it. But I do kind of take the philosophy, like if something, if you're nervous about something, um, and it isn't bachelor is kind of dangerous in fairness, but it, it isn't like clearly a dangerous, stupid idea, then that mm -hmm. might be a sign to go towards it. Hmm. Um, cause you, you'll solve a sort of a crisis within yourself. You'll solve, you'll solve a conflict and oh, show like yourself that. you can do it. You can grow, you can turn into a, a, you know, a person you didn't know who you were. So I really just was so fascinated by the experience of putting myself into the hands of other people and seeing what happened, um, of, peering behind the, you know, velvet ropes of this like fame experience and mm -hmm. this whole bachelor show that I've been watching for a really long time of meeting all these people, of challenging myself, of, of all the, the dates and like the challenges that they're in, like wrestling, like luchador wrestling on my first date was something that would have terrified me, mm -hmm. but I did it. And now I know, oh, I can put on a stupid dress and wrestle against somebody who's like three times stronger than me and get my head beat into the floor in front of an audience and that's fine you know and yeah. I actually have fun at the end so in terms of the romantic aspect like it didn't exist I was like there's no way the bachelor's gonna like me there's no the odds are so against me I didn't even understand going in with a romantic intention mm -hmm. the only promise I made to myself was be open to it you'll have a more fulfilling experience if you let yourself fall for this guy mm. and that's what I did I wouldn't say I fell in love but I you know, that yeah, it, it sounds like it almost surprised you the experience because you sounded like very logical going into it and almost knew how it was going to go. But I love that it ended up differently for you. How did it affect then for you dating after the show? Like what changes did you make or did you make changes after the experience? Yeah. I remember thinking at first, like, yeah, I'm changed. I'm going to have these more serious conversations and like yeah. really talk about marriage and everything. And I, I feel like I did that to some extent, but also as soon as I got off the show, I called this guy that I'd met right before the show and was like, Hey, want to resume? Like I had met him like two weeks before the show and he lived in Hawaii. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like I had a boyfriend going on, but mm -hmm you know, resumed with him. And then that kind of fizzled in a very classic, like he lost interest in me. And then I felt like a fool kind of way. Mm -hmm. So that I think kind of took away some of the, like some of the confidence boost of the show. Yeah. Um, I do think that I thought of myself as a more bold, courageous person, but I also think that it made it really difficult to date in that period because I was so obsessed with the show. I was so obsessed with the online feedback. Bachelor mm -hmm. in Paradise was the next thing. And so mm -hmm. I think men saw me as like not in a serious part of my life. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have any of like the emotional things that I feel like almost everyone goes through after the show? Or were you just on this dating journey and kind of avoided that for yourself? Like what were, what were your emotions like after leaving the show? Because you left in a very intense way. You had to leave for your job. And I yeah. feel like you didn't get to tell him that or something. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. How was your emotion after? Uh, I think Ari got really conflated with the experience itself mm -hmm. and with the opportunity for fame and money. Mm -hmm. So I've often actually said in podcasts, like, yeah, part of me regrets it. And I should clarify that it wasn't that I regretted breaking up with Ari. It was like leaving the show before I necessarily had to. Yeah. And then all of the angst that came with getting my airtime removed and, um, things sort of edited down in a, I don't know, just like a less serious way. Mm -hmm. And then like watching my friends go get all these opportunities that I felt like I had forfeited. Yeah. Um, so coming off the show, I still had feelings for Ari for like a couple of weeks. Um, I remember I was able to text him, um, like really like a really quick back and forth just to say like, I miss you. And he's like, yeah, I miss you too. I've been thinking a lot about you. So that, that kind of thing. Um, but then I, again, like I was 
like this Hawaii guy, like it was, yeah. I was a much more natural fit. And so I, <laughs> my, my feelings turned quickly to him, mm-hmm. but my angst really came from, I had this huge opportunity. I thought I was going to get kicked off like the first three weeks. I didn't. Mm-hmm. Holy shit. My, like my view of myself is changing. Like, am I one of the hot, cool girls? Like, do I get to be that kind of person who deserves fame and can hold this and everything? And then like, mm-hmm. oops, nope, never mind. Uh, and then just people were super mean online and there was somebody spreading rumors about me. And so I had to deal with all the stress of that. Mm. And so I just, I didn't handle that aspect as well as I thought that I would have. And I would say that I was really anxious and really angry for like two years. <laughs> yeah, I know. I feel that. I feel like it's, it's something that everyone goes through, even if they do get like more of what that you could have gotten, if that makes sense. Like, I feel like there's always that underlying feeling of like, oh, she has like a little bit more of a falling or she got an mm-hmm. more, more notoriety or, which is like yeah. ho- horrible to say. And everyone's like, that's like the thing that you're not supposed to say, but it is like, it becomes a comparison thing naturally, especially at those first two years off the show, because yes, you get to see your friends go do these awesome things. And it's not like an ego thing. It's more of just like a, an experience thing. And you, for whatever reason, that show just puts people on different pedestals based on viewership, editing, so many things that go into it. So it's easy to feel like, oh, I wish I would have had this experience. Maybe these things would have gone differently. But once you get out of them, it's like, oh, who cares? <laughs> That's how yeah. I feel now. But at the time, I could totally, I totally remember those feelings of like, I wish I would have had this because I think both of us too are very career driven. So you just think of like ways that we could have, you know, elevated yeah. those things. Right. Um, it, I think what was really frustrating was that a lot of people online too were saying that I was desperate and pathetic and like that I thought I was above everybody else, but really I'm just another like thirsty, mm. et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, yeah, for leaving the show. right for, no, for like, for, I would come on podcasts like this and be fairly honest about like, yeah, I, I am jealous of my other yeah. classmates. I'm like, I feel bad about this, this, and this. Which I um, love that you do that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's maybe better in retrospect once that's passed, you know, but at the time it, I just got so much ridicule for it. And I'm like, it's it just, it was a feeling of being super misunderstood. Mm-hmm. And then people would start warping the things that I had said. And so I, I just felt like really alone in feeling the jealousy and mm-hmm. the insecurity and the anger, and then it, it would get distorted. And then I would just make me angrier and angrier. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's pretty impossible. I think not to feel those things because there's an immediate social hierarchy that happens mm-hmm. like, yeah my friend has 600,000 Instagram followers. That friend has 1 million. I have Mm -hmm. 50. Like Mm -hmm. it's, it just gives you such immediate information. Yeah. That's just literally data. (laughs) It's data data on yourself. You're like, Oh, great. This is where I line up against all 30 of those women. Yeah. Like, Oh, that friend is uh, getting a free trip to hang out with celebrities right now. And uh, I'm uh, working. <laughs> yeah. They're just certain assets that, that suck. But now when I look at people in that world, I just almost feel bad. I'm like, you are going through this chaos and I don't even know if you know it yet, but it's mm-hmm. so much calmer and feeling more peaceful on the other side. Yeah. 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 And it can also, I think it leads to authentically what is probably best for each individual. And it seems like now with the work that you're doing and the choices that you've made, it's gotten you to exactly where you're supposed to be, but it's hard in the time after where you're like, well, what if I was there? What if I could have done this? But yeah, it's 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 hard waiting for life to work out the way, like, I didn't know I was going to get into Duke. As soon as I got into Duke, I was like, hallelujah, like (laughs) the bet paid off. And that was such, such a relief. But until then. No, (laughs) I love that. I'm wondering then for you, now that you've, you're in this like full education process and you've learned so much about mental health and health and all of that, like, were you able to analyze yourself post-show or analyze certain things that you learned that maybe helped you or did it, was it annoying to know more of the reasons why you were acting or feeling the way that you did? It wasn't annoying to know more. I don't think there's been much research on the effects of fame. Um, So I, I haven't learned I mean, I'm sure there's things I've learned that are relevant, but um, it it still feels like that situation was so outside the realms of like normal human human experience mm-hmm. that it's hard to say. Yeah, God, how would I treat somebody going through that? I think so much of it is just like a passage of time, and that's a hard thing to to wait for. Mm-hmm. But to me, I see the situation is just like super clear. You're put into like that 
degrading of a social hierarchy that it's just so likely to result in in anxiety and anger Mm -hmm. you're being like shit on constantly online it's just so clearly going to to lead to these things so there's a lot of cognitive work you can do and you know try to like restructure your thoughts around it and Mm -hmm. um you can set boundaries and not go on reddit just like advice for everybody (laughs) (laughs) oh those are some of my darkest days is going on reddit oh absolutely yeah yeah Yeah. I totally agree I almost is like I'm finding a parallel right now between like social media in in general for people I think there's a hierarchy there that people are seeing like even with like the rise of TikTok and I was I've been watching on Netflix it's called High Pass it's a horrible show it's but it's about this um all these TikTokers that live in the house together and they have like bajillions of followers between each other and they just make like little videos and they they have so much anxiety and so much like depression and all these things that you wouldn't imagine someone with like all these millions of followers and all the money and all the things that they could ever want. But there's also this underlying like anxiety and things like that, which is so interesting. I think. Yeah. I well, why that is, I mean, I have some hypotheses. So one thing we do know is that anxiety and depression and um, self-harm behavior are like rising pretty precipitously in adolescence and that we don't know if it's because of social media, but the timing is certainly suspicious because mm-hmm. it happened basically like concomitant with the rise of social media. Um, I think when your entire job is to present yourself inauthentically, it's going to make you pretty unhappy. Mm. Also, when you do take a risk and present yourself authentically or attempt to, it's still only sort of a little decontextualized piece of who you are. And then you immediately get like nasty comments from other people, then that's going to bring you down instantly. Um, You are interacting with people who are anonymous, who don't care about you in any real yeah. legitimate way uh and then you know it's like social media has been compared to road rage a million times but it's still an apt comparison like people are just going to be mean because they can hide behind uh their screen name so mm-hmm. it, it's just and and then yeah and then you get the data effect of like my friend over in the next room just got forty thousand views Mm-hmm. I guess on their TikTok video, and I got twenty thousand. Yeah. Now I can't feel good about the fact that actually that's a huge number. Mm-hmm. I'm actually like I haven't made a single TikTok, and I don't know if I ever will. Maybe it's, for the podcast, but I'm I'm yeah. afraid of joining that. It's like yeah, it's a lot of highs and lows because with TikTok, it's nice for you can there's viral virality so easily, so it's a great way for businesses and people to mm-hmm. grow really fast. But it's also a very easy. Then you become more vulnerable the more. The more that you're on a platform, the more that you have eyes on you, the more vulnerable you are. So there's so many like pros and cons with it all. So, and it's just a lot of work in general. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's why I haven't, like, I barely know how Instagram works. I don't even make my Instagram stories very pretty. And part of that is just it. I, most of it's probably laziness, but a big part of it is just, I remember when I did put that effort into my Instagram and I was very unhappy while I was doing it. Mm-hmm. So I almost don't want to invest more of myself in something that I know just has negative returns. Mm-hmm. Um, one more question on this, like whole anxiety thing. Like what are some ways from your knowledge and your research, like we can all work on these things. You said medication earlier, but like, what are some, like, I don't know, tools or tactics that we can help because I feel like anxiety is huge right now depression especially after the pandemic is major any yeah. like tools or practices one uh, I mean so mindfulness is really great and that doesn't mean that I'm telling everybody to go out and meditate right now but if you find that you are spiraling um one thing that can help is to you're, you really just want to put some space between your emotion and your reaction to it because the, the reaction is what can actually exacerbate the anxiety because then you wind up you know, not paying attention to something you need to pay attention to or or reacting, like uh, being nasty to other people or avoiding something that could make you happier. So you want to find some space there. So one thing is if you notice you're spinning out, take a deep breath and then anchor yourself to something um, in the room that breath is super easy because breath is always with you. Um, but if you don't like that internal of an experience, you can literally just like look at your hands and mm-hmm. notice what's, like, what's the texture of my hands. And you just, you're just trying to get yourself oriented to the present moment for a few seconds. Mm-hmm. And then you really take a stock, like, what am I thinking right now? What am I feeling in my body and what actions, like what, what, what are my behaviors at the moment? Oh, like my shoulders are really tense. Okay. That's something I can actually relax because the more I tense, the more it's going to give feedback to that emotion. So the more anxious I'm going to feel. Okay. So that's one thing I can do. 
oh, I'm thinking that, let's say you're in class and there's a lecture and there's an exam that's just been talked about. Like, I'm thinking that I'm gonna absolutely fail the exam and there's nothing I can do about it. Okay, well, that's an unhelpful thought process. Maybe tell myself a little bit more grounded in reality. If I study, I can possibly succeed. I can do some problem solving around that. And then how am I behaving? Well, I stopped listening to the lecture and I started spinning out instead. So Mm -hmm. what's one thing I can do to get myself back on track in the present moment? And then you do it. So if it's taking very deliberate notes of even verbatim what the professor is saying, just anything to get you back in. Mm -hmm. So the goal really there is to stop forward thinking and past thinking, because that's where you're going to spin out. And that's also what you can't control and to get yourself present focused and also not to judge yourself for the feelings that you're having. Mm -hmm. So, because once you start judging yourself and you're just piling on negativity. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's one thing. Uh, Another thing is if you, if you start noticing behaviors that aren't working for you, just literally do the opposite unless of course the opposite isn't good or isn't justified, but yeah. Um, you know, let's say like you apologize excessively, like excessively. And that can also have a feedback like, oh, I'm somebody who's constantly sort of submitting myself to another person. I'm always telling somebody that I'm somebody I have to apologize for instead, Mm -hmm. thank them, um, you know, say, put your shoulders back, say something super confidently, just sort of try to start doing the opposite of the behaviors that aren't serving you. Mm, I love it. I want to take these last few moments for you to kind of plug your podcasts and speak on what you guys are doing. Cause I love, I loved being on, I I felt like I was in therapy. Like I felt emotions. (laughs) I was like going through it. Um, and I love what you guys are all about. So a little brief, whatever on your podcast. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so my podcast is a little help for our friends. And the reason it's called that is there's a lot of mental health podcasts already out there, but we're really trying to, talk not just to the person who's suffering, but to their friends and family so that their friends and family can feel less alone and frustrated and tired, um, you know, taking care of this person and Mm -hmm. extending themselves so that they can actually know, here's something I can do to really help my friend. Here's a boundary I probably need to set. Here's how to set a boundary. Um, And yeah, we just try to kind of like bring awareness to these different disorders, help people understand them more, help them understand like oh that's where this behavior is coming from it's, it's coming from this process it's not coming from them being a sh- you know a, a bad person or a selfish person it's it's coming from depression for instance mm-hmm. so we uh my co-host is kibby mcmahon she is a clinical psychologist also graduated from duke and we have if we don't know enough about a topic we'll have an expert come on and our experts are usually people from um very prestigious you know stanford harvard duke etc Incredible. So, and then sometimes we interview people like Sydney. <laughs> yes. I'm <laughs> also from, from Harvard and Duke. <laughs> yeah, for yeah, sure. But you, but you can, it's sometimes though, like you burn out on listening to experts and you want to yeah. hear people who can just speak really personally about an experience. So yeah, we love having you on. Thank you. Um, Jack, Jacqueline, what's like one last piece of advice or one leaving thought that you want to end us on? I would say it's, we say this in our podcast all the time about validating others. It's also important to validate yourself. So if you notice, like I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling sad. Why am I feeling that way? That's so stupid. Everybody's having a hard time right now. Why am I having such a hard time? Like, why can't, well, now you're just making your mood tank. Mm -hmm. And if instead you could say, I'm sad right now because I haven't been able to leave my house in three days or because I don't know what's going to happen in the world or just because, and that's okay to sometimes be sad. You're keeping that mood contained and you're keeping it just the original emotion. Mm -hmm. So really like learn how to talk to yourself the way you would to, you know, a friend, um, and, and learn how to say my emotions are my emotions. It's okay that I'm experiencing them. I don't have to be judgmental. Mm -hmm. I guess that's what I'd say. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Where can everyone find you, follow you, your podcasts when you have episodes out, all that stuff? So we have episodes out every Wednesday, similar to another I show guess. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you can find us on all the major podcast platforms. Um, again, it's a little help for our friends, not to be confused with a song. You can find me on Trumbolina on Instagram, which is T-R-U-M-B-U-L-L-I-N-A. So it's like the bowl and Thumbelina mixed and uh same on Twitter although I'm much more active on Instagram and that's about it thank you so much